Hi everyone, and welcome to this Friday morning lecture. I'm Eyal Robinstock, host of today's session on genetic landscape of pediatric thyroid cancer, which is a topic that was requested by our audience and specifically by our audience, the pediatric endocrinologists that joined this session. So during the session, we welcome questions. And after the session, after the, the two lectures that we have, we'll have a Q&A session, a quest session with questions from the audience and from the faculty. We have two leading experts with us today to discuss this session, this topic, Jonathan Wasserman from Toronto and Dr. Amy Franco. Dr. Wasserman is an MD and PhD. He's an endocrinologist and associate professor at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. His clinical focus is pediatric endocrine neoplasms and endocrine sequelae of childhood cancer therapy. And his primary research focus is genomics of childhood endocrine tumors and healthcare utilization among these children. He's a co-chair of the ATA Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Guidelines and a member of the Long-Term Follow-Up task, follow task Force of Pediatric Endocrine Cancers. Following his talk, we'll have Dr. Amy Franco. She's a PhD and director of the Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Translational Research Laboratory at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is the first translational research program dedicated to pediatric thyroid cancer in the U.S. Dr. Franco graduated with PhD in cancer biology from Vanderbilt University in 2007, then moved to New York for postdoc fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and today her lab focuses on comparing genetic alterations in, genetic, in pediatric and adult patients, on tumor microenvironment, and the immune landscape of thyroid cancer. She, she's uh, passionate about advocacy, both for research and improved patient care and quality of life in, of these patients. So it's a pleasure to have you both with us. Jonathan, the stage is yours, and it will be followed by Amy, please. Thank you so much, Al. Let me just uh, load up my slides. Well, thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited and to share the uh, the podium, the virtual podium with Dr. Franco, who I've known for quite a while and who uh, collaborate with very uh, fruitfully and, and uh, enjoy uh, working with her. So uh, we're going to present the talk in two parts. I'll start off and then uh, hand over the baton to Amy about halfway through. These are our disclosures. And I'll start off with a case. And that's one of an eight-year-old boy who was followed in my own clinic. Uh, he presented otherwise healthy, and uh, he'd seen his family physician with a cough. Uh, he'd had a diffuse cervical adenopathy, and his grandmother had just returned from overseas and had known to have a tuberculosis contact, um, and a chest x-ray was somewhat concerning, so he was sent into our emergency department. The child himself had no constitutional symptoms or compressive symptoms, and he had uh, an asymmetric thyroid exam. His left lobe was quite firm, where, whereas his right lobe was soft, um, and his, his uh, neck was full of lymph nodes. This was one image from his ultrasound, and you can, for those of you that are used to looking at these, you can see that on the left side, there's a complete replacement of left lobe with diffuse echogenic foci. There was really no normal parenchyma on the left, although the right is relatively normal. This was a CT, a coronal CT, and it shows, again, uh, quite bulky adenopathy, particularly on the ipsilateral side, although there was uh, some on the, on the opposite side as well. And these were his lungs. And, and what this is showing us is that in both lung fields, uh, they're really full of small, uh, diffuse pulmonary nodules. And this is not an atypical scenario for us. About 20% of children with thyroid cancer uh, are diagnosed with M1 disease initially. His surgical pathology was consistent with the diffuse grossing variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Again, a disease which is much more common in the pediatric population. And this was done several years ago and, and we were able to get some initial limited genotyping. And it was, it was a little discouraging because his, genotype, his tumor genotyping uh, was negative for everything that we were able to test for at the time. Uh, and that included the BRAF V600E variant, NH and KRAS, RET PTC1, PTC3, and PAX-A PPAR gamma. He underwent uh, two rounds of radioactive iodine therapy uh, with fairly hefty doses. And despite this, 
his lung disease progressed over the period of four years. And he was deemed a couple of years ago to have developed radioactive iodine refractory disease. So I'm gonna pause with the case there and come back to it in a few minutes. And then sort of go back to, to sort of ethos of why Amy and I, or at least one of the reasons that Amy and I have focused much of our research in understanding pediatric thyroid uh, cancer and the genomics of pediatric thyroid cancer. This is a study from Ernie Mazzaferi now almost 30 years ago. Uh, and to me, this sort of set the stage for the science of pediatric thyroid cancer. And, and this figure shows that thyroid cancer varies clinically depending on the age of presentation. Uh, and it can be divided roughly into three stages. In the initial stage within the pediatric age group, this table or this chart shows a high rate of recurrence, but very low cancer-related mortality. Within the middle age, uh, which I now find myself nestled, recurrence rates are much lower uh, and mortality remains low. And then towards the third phase of thyroid cancer, both mortality and recurrence rates rise together. This was crystallized a, mil a little bit more comprehensively or much more comprehensively about five years ago by the group at the Mayo Clinic uh, led by Ian Hay, where they looked at eight decades worth of their own single institution experience. Um, and what they demonstrated in this retrospective study was that children in general have larger tumors, more frequent lymph node metastases, more frequent pulmonary metastases, and more frequent extrathyroidal extension. We looked at our own experience at SickKids over 20 years and broke down that pediatric age group, not just into the zero to 18 or 19, but looked within the pediatric age group. And here you can see we've split that into zero to 10 years old, so the largely prepubertal, peripubertal, and adolescent age groups. And we found that within the pediatric age group, there's again a spectrum that the youngest children, the prepubertal children, tend to have more invasive disease with much higher rates of N1B, lateral neck disease, higher rates of pulmonary distally metastatic disease, and higher rates of angioinvasion as compared to the peripubertal and the, uh, the adolescent groups. So to summarize the clinical distinctions, which sort of led us to asking the underlying biology, Pediatric patients have a higher rate, I didn't discuss this, but when we're looking at nodules, children with nodules have a higher rate of malignancy, higher rates of lymph node involvement, lung disease, multifocality, and as Mazzaferi showed us 30 years ago, uh, much higher rates of recurrence. In summary, pediatric thyroid cancer is a different entity. Moving on to the underlying molecular landscape, this is what was known, this is what's been known for a good 20 years uh, based on knowledge in adults, that, that adult thyroid cancer throughout is largely driven by aberrations in the RAS, RAF, MAP kinase, and the PI3 kinase mTOR pathways, and results from either point mutations or gene fusions in elements of these two divergent pathways. And as uh, the disease progresses, multiple mutations can accumulate during, during the course of dedifferentiation. Nine years ago now, the uh, adult PTC genome was published by the Cancer Genome Atlas Network in Cell. Uh, and this is summarized here in a very uh, uh, thorough but complex slide. And I call this the adult PTC genome. That wasn't the title of the paper. But among this cohort of, of nearly 500 tumors, only three of the tumors were derived from patients under the age of 18. Um, and so when we as pediatricians and as those interested in pediatrics looked at this, Really, we wondered whether this could be extrapolated to children or not. For those of you that aren't familiar with looking at these oncoprint figures, uh, the upper area shows different patient and tumor characteristics, such as age, histology, gender. The second shows single nucleotide variants in an in individual tumor. Each column represents a different tumor. And down here are gene fusions. This same data are some uh, so sorry. Um, about in the adult PTC genome, about 60% of tumors were driven by BRAF B600E. And these are mostly, if you can see the second last row here, these are mostly classical variant tumors. But 13% were RAS driven. Those are follicular tumors, follicular variant tumors. 15% were driven by gene fusions. And another 10% were left with no clear driver mutation, what they referred to as dark matter. The same data are summarized here in this pie chart. Um, and I'm going to refer back to this, but most importantly, 
about 73% of the changes in adult PTC are associated with single nucleotide variants. At around this time, a number of uh, small series were conducted looking at the genomics of pediatric tumors. And this is just a summary of those that were in existence uh, when we started the work out here at SickKids and when, when Dr. Franco started the work that she's gonna present later. And those data are, are shown in this table, but also summarized here in contrast to the adult data. So this is the, the chart I showed you previously, and these are the pediatric data in existence at the time. And what you can see is much smaller proportion of BRAF, slightly larger proportion of gene fusions, and roughly 60% of the children using the technologies at the time had tumors driven by unidentified genetic changes. So they had no oncogenic driver. So this led to the question of what comprises the dark matter and does this dark matter explain the different clinical behavior that I showed you in the first few slides. So taking a similar approach to that was, which was used in the TCAG, we at SickKids and, and several other groups that I'll cite in a moment uh, used next generation technologies, both whole exome and whole transcriptome sequencing on a cohort of pediatric, exclusively pediatric tumors to try to answer these questions. And those data from our group are summarized here. And again, this is similar to the TCAG paper where patient and tumor characteristics are on the top. And in contrast to the TC, sorry, TCGA paper, we found that substitutions instead of 73% comprised only 30% of pediatric tumors. Fusions were 67%. And only one of our tumors, so only 2% of tumors, were we unable to identify a driver mutation. So the dark matter was instead of 10% down to 2%. So we took the adult data, contrasting that with the, trans the next generation pediatric data and show a very different landscape of mutational events in the pediatric tumors with roughly two thirds of pediatric tumors driven by gene fusions uh, and a number of other single nucleotide variants that were less, that were more commonly represented in children than in adults. This again summarizes the pediatric data. And in red, I show those, those variants that are common in the adult tumors, BRAF, NRAFs, and the RET PTC1 and PTC3. But what we can see in children is that there's a much more diverse palette of driver mutations that are associated with the tumors. And the fusions in particular, uh, instead of predominantly being driven by RET PTC1 and PTC3, are far more promiscuous with multiple different fusions comprising the spectrum of oncogenic drivers in children. Notwithstanding this diversity, there seems to be a limited number of fusion partners. So even though there are multiple genes involved, um, there are some common themes with RET, NTRIC 1 and 3, MET, ALK, and THADA being the fusion partners accounting for almost all of the pediatric fusion-driven tumors. This is, of course, relevant because many of these have associated systemic therapy available now. Like we did clinically, we also tried to look at whether there were variations in these patterns within the pediatric age group, not just looking at children as a whole. And we did see that the youngest children, those under 10 or the prepubertal group, were almost entirely, about 80% were driven by fusions. This carried through the, the peripubertal age group. And as the, the individuals got older, the proportion of fusions gave way to more single nucleotide variant driven tumors uh, until it reached the proportions. And this is the data from TCGA. So there's a gradual transition from fusion driven tumors to single nucleotide variant driven tumors. This is just the slide I showed you earlier, recapitulating that the same age pattern is associated with clinical differences as well. And this is a slide stolen from one of uh, Amy's papers. She told me she wasn't gonna show these data and I really like them. So I decided to, to, uh, to display them with her knowledge. Um, but importantly, this is trying to associate that finding of drive, oncogenic driver type with a clinical phenotype. And what Amy's group showed, uh, along with many others in Philadelphia, is that the fusion-driven tumors shown here circled in red tend to be bigger than other tumors in children. They tend to be more associated with lymph node metastases and more frequent lung metastases. So very similar themes to what I was talking about at the beginning. Importantly, these are associations and not causal relations. And uh, towards the second part of the talk, Amy's gonna speak a little bit about work to try to tease this apart. 
So going back to our patient, reminder, he had uh, distally metastatic disease uh, in the prepubertal age group, age eight when he presented, and despite two cycles of radioactive iodine, had developed progressive radioactive iodine refractory disease, and initial genotyping was negative for the most common variants found in adults. He was a participant in our study and did undergo both exome and transcriptome sequencing of the tumor, and an ACAP13 RET gene fusion was identified. And this is one that hadn't been described previously in thyroid cancer. Recognizing that this was a RET-driven tumor, he was eligible for, for enrollment in a study of RET-driven therapy with sulfurcatinib. And you can see that within two months, his lung disease uh, significantly uh, reduced, and about 20 months later uh, was was significantly, significantly improved, and he remains on therapy with ongoing response to treatment. Just a, a few more slides to wrap up my part of the talk. Knowing that there are different uh, types of variants or different distributions in the class of variants between single nucleotide and gene fusions, the next question was, how do these differences impact gene expression? One of the, one of the really important uh, aspects of the TC GA paper was to classify the impact of the gene variants. And they looked at this in a number of ways, and we, we performed a similar analysis. The first was to look at the impact on signaling through this ras raf map kinase pathway. And looking at gene expression uh, of genes involved in MAP kinase sing or ERK signaling, we could see that the fusion-driven tumors here, shown with asterisks, had much higher levels of expression of MAP kinase-driven genes. And those uh, other ones, including the P10 and Dicer-driven tumors, had lower MAP kinase signaling. Similarly, TCGA looked at uh, what was called a thyroid differentiation score, looking at the expression of 16, I think, I believe it was 16 different genes associated with the differentiated state of a thyrocyte. And similarly, the both the RAF, BRAF and fusion-driven tumors had significantly lower levels of thy differentiated thyroid gene expression, whereas other, the single nucleotide variants, uh, and we included a number of benign adenomas in our, in our series, had higher levels, not surprisingly, of thyroid-specific gene expression. We used a, an approach called multidimensional scaling to try to group tumors like with like in terms of those that had similar gene expression profiles would show up next to each other or closer to each other in two dimensions. And that's shown here so that, that those tumors that had similar gene expression were, shown, were, were located closer together. You can see that there's a category or a cluster up here in the top right, so top left, that combines the benign tumors with histologically malignant tumors. These included the benign tumors shown in green with green arrows, the malignant tumors shown with red arrows, and these malignant tumors carcinomas were driven by Dicer, P10, RAS, and there was one follicular carcinoma included in our series as well. These tumors were also all N0 tumors. None of these patients had associated lymph node metastases. In contrast, those that didn't have gene expression patterns that clustered in this region, 84% of them had nodal metastases, either central or lateral neck disease. These were considered low risk according to the ATA 2015 criteria and the rest were high risk. And as a final question before I hand the baton over to Dr. Franco, we wanted to know whether the gene expression patterns themselves differed between pediatric tumors and adults. So ignoring the geno genomic driver, does the overall gene expression pattern distinguish a pediatric tumor from an adult tumor? When we put all the tumors all together, they, they, they were intermixed. There was no segregation of gene expression patterns between adults and children. We had a few tumors that, were, that had recurrent drivers. And so we then asked the question, when you're only comparing tumors driven by the same oncogenic change, is the gene expression pattern different? So, so RET PTC driven pediatric tumors different from are they different from RET PTC driven adult tumors? And what you can see here is that that did turn out to be the case with a small end, very small end, and this will need to be uh, reassessed. So, in the navy blue here are all the adult tumors driven by RET PTC one, and this is TCGA data directly derived, um, and these are the pediatric RET PTC one driven tumors, and they're very distinct expression patterns. This was not the case with BRAF-driven tumors, where the pediatric tumors seem to, to be distributed. 
And I'll remind you that the BRAF driven tumors tended to be the adolescents, whereas these tended to be the younger children. So that may be there. And these data are just shown in a different way in three dimensions where the red PTC driven pediatric tumors seem to be falling out separate from the adult tumors, but not the BRAF tumors. So with that, I will hand over the baton. This is the, my reminder to, to stop sharing and hand it over to Dr. Franco, and then we'll take questions at the end. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. And you've teed this up well for me. Let's just get my slides up. And you on the right screen, or do I need to swap displays? You can no, see you're good. All right. So um, thank you and good morning to all of you. Thanks for joining. I am going to go through, you know, I think Jonathan did a great job of, of teeing all of this up. I will say that, you know, as a basic scientist and translational scientist, I look at these um, data in a little different light. Um, so I'm going to go through and kind of talk about this through the lens in which we see um, some of these changes and similarities uh, between the pediatric and adult tumors. And I just wanted to bring your attention to this because in, in a we are seeing a rise in pediatric uh, thyroid cancers, similar to the rise that we're seeing in adult tumors. But what's very striking and different between the adult and the pediatric setting is that in adults, we know the majority of this increase in thyroid cancer that we're observing are in these, what we te are deem microcarcinomas, those very small tumors, less than two centimeters. But what's really interesting is in the pediatric population, we're seeing this increase in these microcarcinomas, but we're also seeing a dramatic increase in these tumors that are greater than two centimeters. So I really think that this is suggesting that there is, in fact, a uh, significant increase in pediatric thyroid cancers. And I think we really also need to look at this through the lens of not only do we have an increasing incidence, but as Jonathan has talked about, the mortality is very low. So we're looking at a significant increase in patients being diagnosed now, but that also have an entire lifespan ahead of them. Um, and this survivor population is only going to continue to grow. So I really think it's so important for us to understand uh, the mechanisms, the biology of these tumors, and to further understand how we can uh, more effectively treat these tumors, not in regards to survivorship or survivability, as we know the mortality is low, but to make sure that we have therapies in place for these patients and that we can preserve quality of life throughout the, the lifespan of these patients. So Jonathan has really robustly uh, summarized the data. And, you know, I look at this through a different lens. When I started my lab, what was very interesting to me is the fact that we know that MAP kinase drives the the development of almost all thyroid cancers. This is the most commonly mutated pathway in thyroid cancer pathogenesis. So activating MAP kinase through any of the effectors in this pathway lead to the development of thyroid cancer. But what was really interesting to us is that RAS mutations primarily lead to the development of follicular thyroid cancers or follicular variant papillary thyroid cancers. We know these have unique histopathologic features. And we also know that these tumors primarily metastasize to distant sites through the blood, to the lungs, and to bone. This is the case in the adult setting, whereby we know that BRAF mutations are most commonly associated with classic and papillary thyroid cancers, and that these um, tumors primarily metastasize to the local lymph nodes. Again, this is what we knew from the adult setting. However, in the pediatric setting, we also know that PTCs have a high propensity to metastasize to the lungs, and we see this greater uh, pulmonary metastasis present within the pediatric population. So for us, this raised some very interesting questions, and from the science perspective, that although we see similar spectrum of mutations, they're obviously in different proportions between the adult and the pediatric patients, whereby the fusions are much more common in the pediatric, but we're still seeing activation of this identical pathway, and they seem to be having, regardless seem to have very different phenotypes um, and mechanisms of action between adults and pediatrics. And this is what has been what we've been trying to dissect using pediatric models, using clinical and patient data. Um, and at the very end, I'll show you using some mouse models to try uh, to dissect these differences and understand the mechanisms. So I really wanted to talk through a little bit of the genomics of thyroid cancer um, and the ways in which we've been looking at it. Um, as Jonathan really illustrated, the, the numbers and the proportion of these mutations that we see across the pediatric versus adult setting are very different. Um, and we know that there's a lot of uh, fusions that are present within the pediatric population, which means they're not present on all of the assays that we're using in the adult population. So it really has um, been essential for us to use different techniques to detect these 
fusions and um, mutational spectrum in the pediatric population. And that's why we've used this targeted exome sequencing as well as a multiplex PCR technology so that we really can understand um, the entire spectrum. And very similar to uh, the data that Jonathan already showed you, um, I'm just briefly, you know, we had very similar uh, observations in our cohort that we looked at at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, whereby the younger patients and especially in this pediatric population, the vast majority of the patients were highlighted and found to have fusion driven oncogenes either in the RET with NTRAC family members, but we also saw other fusion um, partners as Jonathan has already talked about. We did see BRAF mutations. Um, this was in about 20% of the population. And similarly, we saw that, and, and as Jonathan showed you with that other data, that we found that the patients that had fusion-driven oncogenes um, tend to have larger tumors, more invasive tumors, and more widespread metastasis, whereas the BRAF drivers were associated with smaller tumors and uh, less invasion. And this is the inverse of what we see in the adult population. And this is what started to drive us from a mechanistic um, idea is why would BRAF behave differently in adult patients versus pediatric patients? And why do we see so many more fusions um, in the pediatric population? And very similar, or, you know, just to summarize and just really briefly introduce this concept is the fact that even though we see similar driver mutations within the adult versus the pediatric population, the, the proportion of those uh, drivers is very different, but also the invasiveness um, and the, the, the metastasis is highlighted here to the lymph nodes is very different between um, the pediatric versus adult population, even when they have the identical driver mutations. So this is, you know, telling us, or at least uh, was hinting to us that there must be something different about the way in which these oncogenes are transforming um, between the pediatric and the adult uh, population. And I think Jonathan's done a great job of showing you um, all of that data. I wanted to kind of um, also illustrate a point that he'd started to touch on is some of these different mutations that we see between the adult and the pediatric populations and how they affect these populations differently. And one story I wanted to highlight and tell you about is a Dicer population. And this was tumors that we found discovered to be driven by the Dicer 1 mutation. This was a collaborative study that we had um, done with Jonathan, but we were really interested to look at both the mutational landscape and we looked at, at Dicer, but then to look at the gene transcription and the molecular transcript of these tumors, looking at both mRNA as well as the microRNA profile of these tumors. And we employed this just gives you some of the, the characteristics of these patients. Um, we used an array profile and utilized uh, a company HTG molecular diagnostics at which we could look at a, a number of microRNA targets as well as mRNA targets uh, within this population. So really briefly, Dicer is um, a protein that's involved in the production of microRNA and microRNA biogenesis. These microRNAs really act as uh, modifiers within our genome to allow gene science silencing throughout kind of our own siRNA that's within the regulated within by ourselves. And Dicer really, it binds and it cleaves and is responsible for uh, the production of all of these microRNA uh, products, which then can selectively bind to target genes, um, lead to their degradation and transcriptional repression. So it has been shown, we all know Dicer 1 is associated as a cancer predisposition syndrome. This is patients that have one allele that inactivates Dicer, um, and then most often acquire a second mutation in this RNase 3B domain, which really is that protein that's responsible for cleaving these microRNAs. So we had a small subset of patients that harbored Dicer 1 mutations, three patients. We knew that they had mutations in this RNase 3B domain, and we were really curious to determine whether... Um, um, this was associated with a specific microRNA signature and whether this could distinguish um, benign from malignant Dicer 1 um, patients. So this really, again, just highlights that uh, Dicer is part of this uh, RNA complex, which is responsible for cleaving these microRNAs. The RNase 3B domain is responsible for cleaving what we call these 5P arm microRNAs, 
whereby the, the 3A protein is associated with cleaving these 3P microRNAs. And we know that the hotspot mutation is actually um, in cancer is in this RNAs 3B domain, and whereby it leads to an imbalance, whereby we don't get cleavage of these 5P arm microRNAs, and we see an overexpression of the 3P microRNAs. Um, this has been shown here, and you can see, again, in the wild-type dicer cases, we have an equal number of 5P and 3P microRNA species present, whereby when we see uh, tumors that harbor this hotspot RNAs 3B mutation, we see an enrichment of um, globally of these microRNAs from the 3P family. We know that this is also associated with uh, different um, expression patterns. And what we were interested in, what we found is that indeed in our Dicer 1 mutant tumors that are highlighted in the light blue compared to the benign tumors um, highlighted in orange, that we saw upregulation of um, these 3P microRNAs and downregulation of the 5P arm. Again, very similar to what had already been reported in the literature. But what we were interested in and what had been shown um, through scanning and looking at the adult thyroid cancer TCGA data that you've already seen a little bit of is that, um, that there were in the adult population, those that harbored Dicer 1 mutations, there was a small microRNA signature in which uh, 3P microRNAs were enriched in those patients specifically that harbored um, Dicer 1 mutations. And you can see here that these are the two outliers for each of these 3P species. And indeed, all of these outliers were uh, those two cases that were found to be Dicer 1 mutant with the RNAs 3B domain uh, mutations in the adult TCGA. So this led us to really think, can we detect a uh, RNAs 3B um, signature in our pediatric population? And could we use this signature to really distinguish those Dicer 1 mutant tumors um, and distinguish the benign from the malignant Dicer 1 tumors? So this was worked by a postdoc in the lab who developed this 20 micro RNA signature. And I apologize that it's a little bit uh, blurry or at least light here, but we distinguished and we did um, this PCA analysis, you can see the benign tumors, which were encircled, um, the classic papillary thyroid cancers and FTCs is the triangle. And then our three known Dicer cases are these yellow triangle or yellow uh, plus marks. And they all segregated together when we applied the signature. But interestingly, we also identified um, de novo three additional uh, follicular variant uh, papillary thyroid cancers, as well as one FTC that putatively actually harbored a Dicer 1 mutation um, that we didn't know. The, the clinical information in the previous genotyping had not identified a Dicer mutant in these tumors. But indeed, we went on to look at this. We did sequencing. It turns out that one of the FTCs is actually a patient of Jonathan's that came from sick kids. And it looks like after sequencing that indeed each of these uh, follicular variant papillary thyroid cancers, as well as FTCs, indeed harbor um, Dicer 1 RNAs 3B domains. So this mutations. So this microRNA signature was indeed able to um, identify and segregate out these Dicer 1 mutant tumors. So to kind of uh, further extend this, we also wanted to know whether these Dicer mutant tumors had a unique gene expression profile. And as was already introduced, looking at uh, these, the TCGA talked about this ERK score as well as this differentiation score. First, we just look bro um, broadly at um, mRNA expression between the Dicer 1 mutant tumors, now including those uh, putative Dicer 1s that we had identified through the microRNA signature, as well as benign disease. And we can see indeed that uh, Dicer 1 mutate, uh, tumors have a unique mRNA profile compared to the benign tumors. When we then looked and tried to apply this MAP uh, kinase or ERK score, as, as Jonathan already introduced, that was identified in the adult TCGA data set, um, within this targeted profile of my, our mRNAs that we investigated, we found 24 genes um, in this ERK score that overlapped with our panel. And indeed, when we looked at these and again compared between the Dicer 1 mutant versus the benign, we found that the Dicer 1 uh, mutant tumors indeed had... Uh, upregulation of uh, and a higher ERK score identified by upregulation of these, these targeted genes. And indeed, 
saw then, sorry, we then went on to compare these dicer mutant tumors compared to classic papillary thyroid cancers with other driving mutations that have been shown in the past and similar to the data Jonathan just showed you that drive um, more robust ERK activation or MAP kinase score. And indeed, we saw that these dicer one tumors when compared directly to the PTCs had a lower ERK score. So again, similar to the data that Jonathan didn't describe it as much, but that those Dicer tumors fall right in the middle of um, the, the activation of the MAP kinase pathway um, between benign and those with more robust MAP kinase drivers. We then went on to look at the differentiation signature. We had 16 genes that overlapped um, with our expression panel compared to what was reported in the TCGA uh, differentiation score. And again, we found that the, the dicer-driven tumors had a lower differentiation when compared to the benign. But when we went on to compare to the, the PTCs with other drivers, we found that the dicer um, was actually a lower, uh, dif or excuse me, a higher differentiation score than the PTCs. So again, suggesting that these dicer tumors are in fact unique, have a unique score compared to the benign tumors, um, but they are more differentiated and less robustly activated than what we observe um, in papillary thyroid cancers driven by more robust drivers. So I think, um, you know, kind of summarizing what, what I've shown is that, uh, and looking at the phenotypes versus the genotypes that we see in, in our tumors, that we do know, and the data shows that uh, certain mutations are associated with specific subsets of thyroid cancer. The RAS mutations almost exclusively drive um, follicular thyroid cancers or follicular variant papillary thyroid cancers, whereby the RAS or excuse me, the BRAF mutations uh, drive the the papillary thyroid cancers, and then the genomics add yet another layer of us being able to further segregate and distinguish what these tumors mean. But I think we really need to have both the the genotype and the phenotype, and each alone really doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain the distant metastasis that we see, and that there are absolutely significant differences between the way these drivers act in our pediatric versus our adult populations. In the last few minutes, I just want to quickly introduce. You know, we are very interested now that we've made these clinical observations these don't these are correlations not causations and we really want to try to understand uh, the mechanisms that are driving each of these differences and why and how these mechanisms are different between the pediatric and the adult the primary workhorse in my laboratory after we look at uh, the primary patient samples and look at the clinical data is then to use mouse models. We've imported mouse models. These are what I uh, developed when I was in the laboratory of uh, Jim Fagan during uh, my postdoc. We brought those with us. The RAS-driven mouse tumors develop very robust follicular thyroid cancers, whereby the BRAF-driven tumors develop papillary thyroid cancers. These have very histopathologic and clinical features similar to what we see in the adult patients. We do know that uh, these tumors, this is just looking at a mouse thyroid, it's extremely small. This is the normal mouse thyroid. You see nice round follicles. BRAF leads to the rapid development of papillary thyroid cancers in these mice. These uh, thyroids get grossly enlarged. We see very robust and nice papillary uh, tumors that develop with nuclear clearing and many of similar histologic and uh, pathologic features seen in patients. The RAS tumors, again, they develop with a longer latency, but again, develop uh, exclusively follicular thyroid cancers or follicular variant papillary thyroid cancers. They're much more cellularly dense. And again, these tumors, similar to what we see in the adult um, patterning, these uh, mice develop a pulmonary metastasis, you can see these gross lesions. Um, this occurs by about a year in between 30 and 50% of our animals. So these are really providing us now with these robust models to try to, to look at um, the way these tumors progress and follow their trajectory. We've also recently incorporated an NTRAC fusion model into the lab that's allowing us to dissect now what and how NTRAC is behaving in the thyroid um, as a fusion oncogene. And I just want to, you know, the last slide I'm going to show with data is just that we've really now, again, as I told you, these RAS mutations exclusively lead to uh, follicular thyroid cancers or follicular variant. BRAF, similar to what we see in the clinical data, again, exclusively drive the development of papillary thyroid cancers in the mice. 
but this is just data when we looked at uh, what kind of cells were present in each of these tumors, what kind of proportions we used flow cytometry and just globally looked at the non-immune component versus the immune component. And I hope what you can see is that when we have a RAS-driven tumor, there's a much more robust recruitment of immune cells into, into these tumors, whereby when we have a BRAF-driven PTC, we see many fewer tumors, or excuse me, immune cells driven into these tumors, but um, a large proportion of fibroblasts, these are actually what is forming the structures for the papillae. So now we're utilizing these models to try to understand why do these different drivers um, that activate the identical pathway recruit different cell types and how this may be different um, over the different ages of the mice. So I just want to, you know, bring it to your attention. And I think it's really important as we think about our patients is that I hope I've convinced you and Jonathan that we, we do see differences between phenotype um, and the phenotypes, the PTCs, the FTCs behave differently. Genotypes um, drive much of this phenotype or drive many of these different characteristics that we see. But I think we still need to be cognizant that uh, Genotypes are adult commercial assays, do not have the same uh, spectrum of fusions. So using the adult panels isn't always going to be as beneficial for our pediatric patients, um, but also to remember that the vast majority of our patients are still seen in a community setting and may not have access to all of the, the fancy genotyping that I'm uh, very blessed to be able to have access to at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So I really think we need to be cognizant of, of how we do our science, how we do our clinical practice moving forward so that all we have equity for all of our patients and all of these uh, tools are going to be equitably distributed and useful for all of our patients, no matter where they're coming into our clinics, be it in the community or at some of these major centers. So where do we go from here? Just to summarize everything that we've been telling you is that the pediatric and adult thyroid cancers do have differing clinical presentations. Underlying tumor genomics vary. Um, there's a much greater diversity of drivers that we see in the pediatric, um, and many of these are driven by fusions. But and the fusion, as I said, the fusion-driven uh, cancers are enriched in these younger patients, um, not only in the pediatric population, but in that younger pediatric population. So there's still a lot for us to understand why these different drivers present differently and among different populations. But what we know in coming back genotype phenotype is that these different mutational spectra and differential um, clinical behaviors are not explained by the current data alone. We really need these mechanistic studies, and this is why we've really spent a lot of time trying to develop develop these models um, in the laboratory so that we can dissect some of these mechanisms. There really are no existing animal models for pediatric uh, thyroid cancer. There really aren't any commercially available cell lines. So um, we really need to develop more tools to, to better understand what's going on in pediatric space. And I think we need to remember that pediatric thyroid cancer is still a rare disease. So there's a lot of opportunities and need for us to have multi-center consortia collaborations. Jonathan and I have had robust co collaboration for many years now looking at the, the differentiated tumors, um, and now we're actually looking into looking at some of the medullary tumors. We're both members of the, the Child and Adolescent Thyroid Cancer Consortia. Anyone who is interested in this, please contact me, but this is a, a multinational consortia really looking at pediatric thyroid disease, um, collating our clinical information, and moving forward to developing a bio repository so that we can continue to make strides uh, for our pediatric patients. And this work would not be possible without my many collaborators and, of course, uh, the patients. And I thank you all. And let's open it up to questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you both for phenomenal talks. It was really fascinating. And now we'll open the floor for questions. And all the audience are invited to send their questions. We have the first question from Dr. Bello from Israel. And she asks, do you recommend genetic analysis of all biopsy? of all patients with a pediatric PTC or only depending on staging and, and the extent of the tumor? I can start with that. And thanks for the question. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a short question, but it's a loaded question with, with, with a lot of layers to it. I, I think, you know, when you, part, of it, part of the answer depends on your resources and, and reimbursement and, and what, your, what your patients and what your site has available to you and to them. With respect to the biopsy itself, I, I don't think we're at a stage where we need molecular testing of all biopsies. If there's a, you know, an ATA high-risk lesion on ultrasound, it's got Bethesda 6 cytology, that's good enough for me, and it's really not going to change my management. 
there may be a role for less certain nodules when you're talking about the biopsy. Um, and I think one then does need to be cognizant of what we've shown you that the pediatric tumors have different genomics than the adult tumors. And that's going to influence your selection of your molecular test. You need a molecular test that is going to be able to identify fusions with high sensitivity and non-classic fusions. We saw a lot of fusions in our study, and I think in, in Amy's as well, that hadn't dis been described previously. So you need a, a fusion partner agnostic technology. I, I don't think there's any data that would support the gene expression platform, so the Affirma platforms for pediatric tumors. So I would not consider that for, for pediatric biopsy specimens. The other sort of continuation of that is would you consider testing for pediatric tumors? So postoperatively, is there a role for genotyping? And, and I did notice that my, my friend and colleague and mentor, Steve Wagesback, is on the line. And, and Stephen is a wise man, and he once taught me with the words of Sun Tzu, know thine enemy. So as a physician, I'd always love to have more information about a tumor. I'd love to know what's the underlying genomic driver. Again, from a resource perspective, I don't think I need to incur the expense of genomic testing of tumors, if it's an, you know, an N0, a T2 N0 tumor, it's not going to change my management. Um, and so in thinking about this um, in Canada, where we are resource limited, we don't have insurance coverage for most of the genomic testing. And so if we do want to do testing on the tumor, it comes out of the hospital budget, not out of insurance companies. The, the, the approach that we've come up with is that we will do genomic testing on all tumors that are N1B and or M1 tumors. So, you know, lateral neck metastases or pulmonary metastases with the context that that's likely or there's a possibility that in the short or in the long term that will inform management potentially like with the patient I showed you. And even for those sites that may not have the genomic testing available, that may be more distant or not in an academic center or where it can't be afforded, we do try to encourage clinicians who have patients with more invasive disease to at minimum try to bank snap frozen tumor tissue so that if the child in the future or maybe 10, 15 years down the road does develop invasive disease and requires targeted therapy, that those tools may be available. Okay, that's really interesting. We have a question from Pina Jacqueline Smith, and she asks, is there a contact email or other form of email, uh, contact for the consortium that uh, Amy, you, this, you mentioned? And of course, I should have brought the email address, but you can always email me at I can put it in, is it easier to put it in the chat or I don't know if they can all see it, but I am Franco, F-R-A-N-A-1 at chop.edu. And as John said, thyroid.study at chop.edu. That will get you all of the information um, and in the right context. Okay. Stephen wrote, what was in fact, that great talk, Jonathan and Amy. Hey, I have a question and that regards the age of 18. So a patient 17 and a half will be treated by a pediatric endocrinologist. They'll have a total thyroidectomy, radioiodine, and uh, his brother or anyone else 18 and a half is going to be treated by adult endocrinology with active surveillance, with lobectomy, with less radioactive iodine. So Jonathan, you presented some data about the continuum of thyroid cancer and how it changes over with age. So how do you see this? Threshold. Yeah, it, it's it's not a straight, it's a, it's a controversial topic. And certainly when the initial pediatric guidelines were developed, uh, and, and neither of us were involved with that, so so take no no credit and I guess no blame, but but needed to establish some sort of criteria. What who do these apply to? And and the the feeling at that time was that 18 was an age where in general development has has concluded. There, there are no further changes, no further growth. You know, the, the hormonal milieu is, is less dynamic than it is at younger ages. And so that was identified as a reasonable age to consider the transition to adulthood. Anecdotally, I, I agree with you, Ayal. And I think probably the answer is after, you know, after puberty is, is the real biological answer. I don't know whether we'll actually be able to come up with a genetic 
answer when is this a pediatric tumor or an adult? Because I, I have a 17 year old patient now who has a very pediatric looking tumor. And although it is BRAF driven, but I, I think it's probably related to puberty. It's very hard to gather those data because that's not necessarily clinical information that we necessarily gather. Um, not most children, or especially in large consortia, don't have Tanner staging done when they're coming in with a neck mass. And so to gather those data and then statistically to analyze those are hard. We'd probably have to use, you know, in cubic spline approaches or something. But my gut feeling is that that's probably around the, you know, mid-teens where that transition happens. And I will often treat my older adolescent patients as though they were adults, but, but there is no hard and fast rule to that. So a follow-up question for that. Are there any molecular markers that we can use to de-escalate treatment? Because usually in children, we do total thyroidectomy, radioiodine. Are there any markers to to do a lobectomy, for example? No. In short, <laughs> one of the figures I showed you was a sort of a two-dimensional MDS or PCA, and it did show an area sort of in the top left that seemed to be low-risk tumors. And my you know hope is that in the future that those types of analyses that we would be able to generate signatures where, you know, early on in the course, even at the, the level of biopsy, we would be able to identify a tumor as low risk candidate for, uh, for lobectomy candidate for deferral of radioactive iodine. I, I, our numbers are sm so small right now that I would be hard to apply that to a, pa a real life patient, but that's my, my gut feeling. Um, just an answer, I see a question in the chat. Are there commercial available panels that include these version, these fusion variants? There are, um, and I don't want to endorse any particular product, so, um, but you want to you want to use uh, next generation sequencing gene variant based tests, not gene expression based tests. And so the more the more current ones, if not all fusions, they're not they're not transcriptome wide, but they're much more comprehensive than the first and second generation ones. So, so I would, I just would avoid the gene expression ones because I don't think at all validated in pediatrics. Right. And so one that, thing I was just yeah. going to add to Jonathan, because I think it, it, it's an important point is that I don't, we're not at the place where we should be genotyping all of our pediatric patients, but I think this is where these consortiums and the idea when we can do it on the research side, this is not CLIA certified, this will not be actionable, but we need more of these data where we have the long-term clinical information and we have the mutational information that we can put this together and hopefully start to develop some of these, you know, signatures that we can de-escalate care or those that we know are at, at the greatest risk. Um, it shouldn't come at the cost to the patient. Um, and there aren't actionable for many of this to, to use the, or to demand it in a clinical setting. But I think in the research setting, it's going to be absolutely essential for us to be able to collate and correlate this information back. Um, and we have that ability when we have robust data sets to do so and hopefully identify um, these signatures for the future. So we reaching the- I think the that actually yeah. highlights, Amy sort of alluded to it, but one of the challenges we have in pediatrics is the long-term follow-up data. I transition all my patients at age 18 to adult. And so having this initial set of genetic data and then knowing how that translates to their outcome will help us use these data to translate clinically. Right. So I have a last question. Sometimes we get in the pathology report, we have BRAF status, especially if it's a more advanced uh, disease. In adults, we know there's less uh, NIS expression, less radioiodine uptake. Should we look at BRAF mutation in pediatric population the same way we look, we, we think of it in, in adults or, or we should, Think of it as completely different and just treat the patient like everyone else. Amy, what do you think? Well, I was going to say, I don't think, I think BRAF is, is a different beast in, in the pediatric setting. Um, yeah. So I think you have to follow the clinical course and not go off of the molecular profile. Where I get concerned is those patients that are showing up with the, the NTRAC and the RET fusions. And those, I think, are the ones we really, you know, when we they present with the distant disease, I think, you know, knowing that profile and having that arsenal to be able to use the targeted therapies um, and work is undergoing to understand, is this going to change 
um, NIS expression and is it going to change sensitivity to radioactive iodine um, in the future using these molecularly targeted therapies. It's an open question, though, whether the pediatric patients are going to respond the same way with that redifferentiation and re-expression of NIS as what we see in the adult population. And those are the, the very questions that we're asking right now. Yeah, I agree. I think there's actually data that suggests that the, the pediatric BRAF aren't the same as the adult BRAF. They certainly don't seem to progress, at least in our follow-up duration, to de-differentiated or anaplastic disease. And, and there are a few publications that, that suggest that their clinical behavior is milder than the adult BRAF-driven tumors. Okay, this was fascinating. Thank you both, and see you next week. All the best.